Hi y'all. So if you'll recall, about a month ago I did a video talking about Hillary Clinton's emails and why I agreed with the FBI director's decision uh, to recommend no charges. You may find this surprising in our political climate, but not everyone agreed with me. Indeed, some people went so far as to suggest that possibly I could be incorrect. Some of the objections were funny, like for example, well, if this is what the FBI director meant, why didn't the FBI director say this and therefore I'm wrong? Apparently they missed the point that I said at the beginning of the video that I was explaining why I agreed with the FBI director's decision. <laughs> and then I explained why I agreed with the conclusion. I did not purport to be doing a video explaining his reasons. I purported to be doing a video explaining mine. Um, so so for, to, just to assuage anyone of any fear, the FBI director and I did not talk before I did my video. <laughs> and... Uh, he was not purporting to be explaining what I thought on the subject, and I did not purport to be explaining what he thinks on the subject. I purported only to be dealing with the, uh, the conclusion, why I agreed with it, and I gave my reasons. Now, some of uh, the reasons that people disagree with me um, are because they don't understand classified material, which makes sense because, after all, it's secret. And the one thing about a secret, if it's well kept, is that not a lot of people know about it. Nah, I guess so. That work. I guess that's working as intended. But uh, the process, the procedures for handling classified material, and how to market, how to classify it, these are not a secret. These are federal law. It's written there for anyone to go read. And I was particularly um, annoyed by people who used to work in military intelligence or in other fields where they did in fact have security clearances and they would talk about their non-disclosure agreements and what they did and didn't say who also don't seem to understand how this works and then there's a bevy of people who and foreign intelligence services I guess should watch my channel because apparently there are many people who follow my channel who are scholars in classified material scholars in law and all sorts of uh, issues they would need to have some expertise in to go around banding about the bullshit that they claim is the way that it really works. So uh, the people who had non-disclosure agreements from their service in the military or other uh, federal other agencies where they had security clearances with the federal government, uh, you're right, you will get a non-disclosure agreement, uh, you will sign it, and it'll have a whole litany of things that you can't do, and then it'll have a whole litany of, and this is key, potential uh, ramifications if you violate the non-disclosure agreement. And it'll say things like you can be fired, you can be disciplined, security clearance revoked, or p possibly um, you could be prosecuted under and then a litany of statutes. That's uh, put there to put you on notice that these things could happen. Not that these things will happen, uh, particularly on the, litig the uh, prosecution front. Extremely rare that any prosecutions happen. Uh, I'll, more on that later. So anyway, the non-disclosure agreement is to make it clear to you what uh, what your obligations are to remain employed with the people who are giving you the security clearance, what your obligations are with respect to handling it as a matter of internal discipline, and then to point out that you could engage in activities of such a character that you could in the future be prosecuted for it. For example, um, you could write a law that says you know, don't do any murder, and then there's always an unwritten element in every law. It'll be like, and if you get caught, these are the bad things that will happen to you. If it can be proved that you did this, these are the bad things that can happen to you. It's that proof thing that's the, that is the fly in the ointment. The government has to prove certain things. Now, some people did in fact argue that they could have secret trials, which blew me away. Uh, North Korea, the Soviet Union, and China are waiting for you. They have the system that you seem to think is the right way to go. Please go live there and enjoy your life, however short or long it will be. Uh, we do not have secret trials, and it is not true that you can go around just introducing uh, you, um, all this stuff where no one gets to see it in, in trials. Uh, these people who point out the different ways they think they can get around the system say, all the prosecutor has to do is this, or all the government has to do is this. These people fail to appreciate that in a prosecution there are always at least two parties. There's the government, and then there's the defendant. This is the United States of America. This is not the Soviet Union. This is not North Korea, and this is not China. Citizens have rights. Government has power. Citizens have rights. One of the rights of the citizen is to hail the government into court and make it prove its case in open court. And we, we are a defendant-friendly 
legal system, not a state-friendly legal system. These rights belong to the defendant, and they are not they are inviolable. The government doesn't have an option to get away with this. And indeed, this has come up in litigation like in Tenet v. Doe. This is a spy case, but there was a colloquy going on between a uh, super lawyer, uh, Paul Clement, and Justice Scalia uh, on Classified Information Procedures Act, which is on the civil side and then on the criminal side. And they're talking about, he goes, well, you know, look, if, if you have to present this, if it's relevant to your case and you need it, you have to present it in court or you lose. And uh, Paul Clement says, not at all, Justice Scalia. And he goes on to explain, on the civil side. And Scalia said, no, but I'm talking about on the criminal side. You either cough it up or you lose. And Paul Clement, to his credit, uh, representing the United States government and thereby binding the United States government because this is a representation made to the Supreme Court, he goes, you're absolutely right. If we don't present it, we lose. And this is because we have a legal system that empowers every defendant, rich or poor, to force the President of the United States through his officers and lawyers to come into court and lay out his evidence in open court for the whole fucking world to see. The jury, the, the panel, you know, people uh, in the gallery, and they'll talk about, well, they do these various things in child porn prosecutions. They lay it out in open court. Now, that doesn't mean they have to turn the monitor towards the, the audience, so the audience gets the best possible view of the material that's going to be shown to the jury, but it is laid out in open court. It really, really is. If you want to procure a conviction in the United States, uh, unless the person is going to plead guilty, in which case all bets are off, you must present your evidence in open court. And indeed, federal law says that the judge shall make such orders, the, the section I read from in that video, was about what happens when the defendant insists on it. It doesn't matter what the government wants. Of course the government doesn't want classified information laid out in court. That's why its prosecutions are, very, are so rare, because it doesn't have the option but to lay it out in open court, unless they can get the defense to admit to, to stipulate to certain things, which is precisely the kind of things that a defendant isn't going to do if that's going to lead to the defendant being convicted. I mean, only a moron goes, oh, well, you know, I could contest this, but I'll just say, yeah, it's true, I stipulate to their facts because, you know, I want to go to prison. It is a defendant-friendly system, and if you don't like a defendant-friendly criminal justice system, your other option is a state-friendly, which is to say a defendant-hostile criminal justice system. Those exist in the world. Go live under them. So uh, that covers those types of things. And now on to just some of the confusion that people have uh, on the nature of classified material and what does and doesn't count. Simply, uh, in order for something to be classified material, which is to say that it is in fact classified, it one must first be classified by an original classifying authority, and two, it must be designated as such. It's not enough for the person to say, oh yes, I'm I have decided that this meets the criteria for confidential, secret, top secret, or whatever it is, uh, and therefore it'll qualify, but don't mark it. The marking is not optional. It is absolutely necessary that the uh, outer jacket be marked, that the page, that all of the pages, if it's a file series, all the pages on the inside be marked with the, the maximum level of, secure, of uh, classification that any portion of the documents in there will have. And if, it, if it's not a document, uh, there's an email procedure. It must be in the headline. It must be in the subject line. If it is uh, the dissemination of classifi classified material in an oral briefing, you must start off with notice that it is a classified briefing. Uh, you may recall some while ago I did videos, and the titles of it, was, the title was something like, "This briefing is unclassified." I did that quite on purpose. One because it's funny, and you don't need to announce that something is unclassified, but it's good practice to do it if you ever deal with classified material. That way, no one is ever in any doubt about the nature of the material with which they're going to be confronted. And people have worked like JSOC or other, other uh, agencies in the federal government have mentioned that uh, before we ever got anywhere near, they always gave us a briefing. Precisely. That puts you on express, explicit, undeniable notice that before you get anywhere within sniffing range of the classified material, the nature of that material, not a single email that was sent to the secretary, to Secretary Clinton, or sent by Secretary Clinton, forwarded by her after she received it, was marked as classified. None of it was marked. The email that she received did not say, contains classified material, as it's required by law to say. And since it did not say that, you cannot, it, you cannot say that she had actual knowledge 
that there was classified material in there. And some people will respond to that by saying, oh my god, uh, the FBI director even said there were three that were marked. No, he did not, and this is a confusion. You have classification markings, which are uh, very detailed in federal law as to what they must say. You know, who, who's classified under what authority, the expiration date, these types of things, the maximum level. It's very obvious, and in fact, federal law requires that the markings be of such a type that it is immediately apparent to everyone what the material is, the, the nature of the material, not the actual information, because that's what's classified, that you have to open the binder to see it. It must be marked, and they use very bright colors, very bold letters. I mean, if you ever, well, here, look at this. <clears throat> you know, secret, secret. That is a declassified document. You'll notice there are still two redactions in there. And I want you to pay attention to the redaction in the paragraph, not at the heading, that's the person's name. Uh, even, what is this, 40 years later, that little bit right there remains classified. So somewhere in, in some government agency will be an unredacted copy of this declassified, redacted copy that has been made public. And the whole thing will be classified because of that one little whatever is under that black mark, this big. And they're saying that anybody should know, anybody in Secretary Clinton's position, should know that the material she's looking at is classified. One word in a document makes the whole fucking thing classified. One classified word makes the whole document classified from start to finish. They realized this was inefficient many years ago, and they invented something called portion marking, which, once you know you're dealing with classified material, namely in that the exterior is properly marked and all the pages are properly marked, every paragraph that uh, will have a, a little, what's called a portion marking, and it'll look just like this. Or, you know, d depending on the classification level. Only it's small. It looks like a bit like a footnote, only it goes in the front, not in the back. These will, will be immediately clear to someone who's looking for them. If you're not looking for them, it's just text on a page. That's why portion marking is not sufficient to mark classified material. It must be, uh, as is required by law, immediately apparent. Now, I don't know uh, how many of you people have ever read government documents, but they don't tend to be short. So you want me that there are three instances in these 30,000 emails, hundreds of thousands of pages, or words, I should say, that in there, there are three instances, and, and three only, where there was a parenthesis, a C, in parentheses, that you want to tell me that that is sufficient to go into court to prove that she had actual knowledge that there was something classified in there, when anybody could easily overlook that, particularly if you're not looking for it. This is why the requirements for marking are what they are. One, it eliminates any excuse. You can't go get something that's properly marked and say, well, I had no idea it was classified. It's fucking written all over the front. You know, it's got markings, bright colors, this medium is classified, the level of classification, it's in the email header, you know, all, all these kinds of things to make it immediately clear. That satisfies the actual knowledge part. Now, the, uh, as I mentioned in my first video, and some people have said this is not the case because and they give uh, what they think are uh, similar examples, there is no prosecution in the entire history of this country for any conduct that is similar to what Secretary Clinton did. Not a single one. The statute that some people have talked about, there's only ever been one prosecution, and that was uh, a case of actual espionage. The guy was an actual spy and actually knew what he was doing, and my guess is the reason that they, did, they took the prosecution that way is it was easier to get it on that and get a, a prison sentence than it would be to have done the more difficult thing to prove actual knowledge because then you'd have to introduce into the trial more evidence. Anyway, that's just my guess. I don't know. No one, again, the FBI director didn't call me. So, on this, um, this, uh, this marking and satisfying of intent, uh, I'm sorry, knowledge elements and whatnot, that's what the government has to prove that, that we, because we don't, we don't do prosecutions by sharpshooting here. You don't get to smuggle some some little portion, hence the name portion marking, of like that one little redacted piece in page 35 of a 600 page document and then hand it to someone and go, they're guilty. No. It has to be perfectly clear. Uh, and then it, it becomes very easy to go into court and go, well, you know, 
unless the person is going to claim she's, you know, she's unless she's going to say she's blind. So then they'll bring up someone like, well, when General Petraeus was convicted, he pled guilty. So if you can get Hillary Clinton to plead guilty, I will completely, I'll be happy to go along with you and go, yeah, she's probably guilty. I mean, she said I'm guilty, so I'm, <laughs> I don't think she's the most honest person in the world, but I'm willing to give her the benefit of the doubt. If she says, yeah, I'm guilty of, you know, mishandling classified information, I'll go, okay, okay, you're guilty. So, uh, <clears throat> that was General Petraeus. But there's other, other things about the Petraeus case. He took a plea deal, which was given to him because he would have been skewered if he had gone into court. What's the difference between Petraeus's case and Clinton's case? Petraeus, which is strange for a spy, made the really stupid mistake of getting caught by a journalist on tape admitting to disclosing what he knew to be classified information. <laughs> the same reporter he was fucking. Clinton, uh, whether she knew it or not, at least was not sufficiently stupid as to have <laughs> been caught on tape with, by a reporter saying, yeah, you know, that classified material I've been illegally disclosing. <laughs> like Petraeus was. And they mentioned other cases like this, this Navy chief petty officer or petty officer or whatever. Yeah, this guy went into a, a skiff, um, <laughs> rummaged around looking for what he wanted, took the documents, which had secret, top secret written all over it, uh, hit them, smuggled them off the base, and then retained them after he left the service. Or, uh, I don't know if he left the service, after he left that area. Um, there is a big difference between going into a skiff, where you know classified information is, rummaging around, looking for the classified information you want, secreting that classified information on your person, smuggling it off the installation and hiding it, and receiving an email that gives no indication whatever there's anything classified in it. Uh, so th there are some distinctions between Hillary Clinton, who received emails and then forwarded them, uh, and a guy who essentially breaks into a building, you know, kicks open the door, goes in there, finds what he wants, and cat burgles it, essentially, and runs away. Or someone who is stupid enough to get caught on tape <laughs> by a reporter who apparently is doing much better at her job as a reporter than uh, the CIA director <laughs> was at his job at being a spy <laughs> and not getting caught doing shit. She did, it, her, she did her job much better. Uh, catching him on tape, admitting to doing this, Oh, uh, and then, um, well, you, you see the ramifications of that. Uh, now, there are some people who say that she was negligent. I agree she was negligent. Unfortunately, that's not a crime. Gross negligence is. Now, uh, some people have mentioned that gross negligence sounds a lot like extremely careless. They might sound a lot alike to people who don't know shit from Shinola, but they're nothing like each other. Gross um, negligence requires no care. It, it, it is the dividing line between intentionally deciding to do this and not, uh, but as close to intending to do it as you can possibly get. You, so there has to be no no care, whatever. Not just do care, but no care at all. Whatever else you want to say about uh, Hillary Clinton, the fact that she hired an IT expert to look after her server, who installed software that did in fact prevent 100% of the known intrusion attempts by hackers to get access to it, uh, whatever else you want to say about her, that is not no care. That is not do care. Certainly that's not the kind of care that you should have with with sensitive, even though unclassified, but sensitive information, uh, much much more uh, the case, classified information. But the fact that it's, it doesn't meet that level doesn't mean that there's no care. There was there there was a program put on it. Uh, it was effective at preventing all five at uh, intrusion attempts, and that is enough to defeat the force of the law. A law which I point out again has only ever been used once, and that was to prosecute an actual spy, a known spy. Alright, I'll leave it there. Have a great day.